and I'm here today to tell you about that, but I want to put it into the context of my current research program, which is, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, related to biological life support in space, which seems like a far cry from plant-water relations. But uh, it turns out we're not leaving planet Earth without green plants. And all of the plant physiology that we think we understand now has to be redone in the context of the weird environment that we'll expose our life support machines to uh, when we get to Mars and extended missions on the moon, that sort of thing. So uh, I'll take you through a little bit of that just to put into context how we can apply this technology and, and rela relative or relevant technologies uh, to evaluate water relations because in my view, my biased view of course, water is at the center of plants. You can't do anything to a plant that isn't ultimately reflected by its water status and specifically the whole, the total water potential. And there are very few uh, reliable ways of getting at that uh, sort of uh, golden fleece of our plant physiology and biophysics. Um, and the psychrometer has gone through a lot of iterations since Doug Spanner talked about this application back in 1951, which I think is before all of us were born, almost. <laughs> and uh, uh, beyond that, so I'm, I'm really stealing ideas from guys like Spanner and others and uh, combining them in, into a, uh, more recently now, an automated technique of collaboration with ICT. So let's, uh, yeah, I have to turn this thing on. So as, as I said, the, the program at the Controlled Environment Systems Facility in Guelph is dedicated, and it, it's actually the, uh, uh, I guess the largest, the most extensive research program and technology development program for what's called advanced life support, or biological life support in the world. Uh, we have collaborative agreements with NASA, the European Space Agency, and most recently Russia. That was fun. Uh, negotiating collaborative research agreements with the Russians um, is a interesting experience. I'll, I'll explain that someday. This is our home. It's not particularly auspicious. It's a um, but trust me, I spent $10 million on this steel box. And uh, in it we house the, uh, the areas of research. I'm certainly not going to go through all of these. I, that's, that's not the purpose of today. But uh, things like attributes of candidate crops. Um, imagine that all of, the crop, all of the plants that you're going to take are going to have to be edible. And you're going to have to be a vegetarian, at least for the near term of space exploration. And by that I mean the next 200 years. So, attributes of candidate crops. Uh, I, I sit on a committee called the Candidate Crop Selection Committee. It's an international group of space scientists, generally, biological, you know, plant biology types. And it was chaired by Frank Salisbury, which is a name that some of you may recall, but Salisbury and Ross was the Bible of plant physiology when I was an undergraduate. And Frank Salisbury is the venerable icon in in uh, plant physiology in North, in North America, at least. So he chaired this committee. And when I first attended the first meeting uh, at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I, uh, I proposed, I was working with the rose industry in Canada at the time, and I had cut flower in, in greenhouses and looking at controlled environment applications. And I proposed roses and barley. Uh, roses for their psychological benefit, uh, they were quickly dispensed because you can't eat them and you can't afford the mass and energy cost of growing roses on the moon uh, if you can't eat them. And barley, and at the time I was uh, a sort of the brash Canadian on the, on the panel and uh, uh, I also served as the uh, co-convener of the Malt Whiskey Tasting Society of Canada and uh, so I was proposing barley and adding a little levity to the proceedings uh, for because it was my argument that humans, no matter where they go, especially if they go to you know, far distant places, always end up making alcohol. <laughs> and I figured it might as well be the good stuff. And uh, Frank didn't even laugh. Uh, and it was only shortly after that I realized Frank is a teetotal Mormon from Utah and uh, took great offense at this suggestion, so Barley was off the list. But, uh, Frank has since retired, and a very good and close friend of mine, Ray Wheeler, 
who is the head of NASA's life support program at Kennedy, now chairs that committee. And over dinner one night, we formally uh, put Barley on the official candidate crop list for space exploration. So if you ever hear in the future, or if your grandchildren hear, uh, that human explorers made single malt whiskey on Mars, that's how it got there. I'm, I'm going to go just a little bit into hypobaric studies. Um, we look at reduced atmospheric pressure, once again to reduce the mass and energy cost of food production. We want to get it down to an inflatable level of pressure. So we're looking at how plants respond to reduced atmospheric pressure, and this is how we got into the water relations stuff. You'll see the hook in a minute. Here's the chambers that we use. They are, uh, there's nine small sort of single plant uh, rapid turnaround kinds of uh, chambers. And we also do uh, microbial systems in here. Uh, these are the large chambers. Whoops, back up. Uh, scoop ourselves here to just get. These large chambers, um, I guess we can move to the next slide that shows the inside of them, but basically they're, they're about eight, eight and a half tons because they're comprised of really thick walls of stainless steel and uh, they're completely and utterly sealed and inside there's one and a half square meters of growing area. So just to put the mass of life support into context, if you had to have full Earth atmosphere on the vacuum of the Moon or the almost vacuum of Mars to, to support your food production and life support system, you'd need about 60 square meters per individual crew member. Uh, here's one and a half and it weighs eight and a half tons. So clearly that mass cost is prohibitive. And remember, mass and energy is the currency of space travel. Money has nothing to do. You don't spend money on the Moon or Mars. There's no economy there. You spend money, in my case I argue, the Canadian economy is the home of the technology and the expertise associated with biological life support. So it's, a, it's an ongoing argument as to the economic engine content of, uh, of space exploration. So here I'm going to show you a, a quick uh, time-lapsed shot. And, and this is where we started looking at the in impact of our tr strange environments on the water relations of the crop and using the water relations to evaluate uh, the environmental experience of these plants. And we're using uh, sweet pepper here, or capsicum as you call it. The first time I ever heard a news bulletin here talking about capsicum spray. That was just too many syllables to me and we obviously call it pepper spray. But anyway, uh, this is the... Uh, I want you to watch up in this corner there will be a pressure gauge and it will it will follow the course of successive pressure drops in this chamber and then at the end it will bounce back to uh, full atmospheric pressure. Well, and those of you in the front can probably hear Queen in the background. So here it is at full earth atmosphere and these are pepper plants inside one of the larger chambers. And that's more or less than that. That's yes. Less. That's yes. So we're now at approximately 70 kilopascals of total pressure, or roughly 70% of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, not too much of a problem there. And then that next, it's three hours at each at each uh, pressure. Here we are at 40 kilopascals. So roughly again 40% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. at seven hours we'll go to ten. So one-tenth of Earth's atmospheric pressure and corresponding gases. They don't seem to like that too much. Uh, at, at ten hours it will bounce back to a hundred kilopascals or there we are back to a hundred now. Now I have to explain what happened here. Some of you may, may understand intuitively, but it was counterintuitive to me. I saw a total recall. Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he fell out of the Mars habitat, he essentially started to explode, right? Because the pressure gradient from inside his cells to the roughly vacuum of outside. Mars is less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere. So in terms of pressure, it's almost all CO2. <coughs> so he was exploding. These plants did not explode. 
they essentially collapsed, they wilted. Uh, the pressure was, was a tenth of Earth's atmosphere, so 0 0.1 uh, of, of a bar, roughly, and, uh, and they wilted. Now they did not respond in the end. It turns out they didn't respond to total pressure. They responded to vapor pressure deficit. And what this whole film depicts is an artifact in our management or mismanagement of atmosphere control inside the chamber. The chamber, when it got down to a really uh, low level, the, the density of the atmosphere was being sucked dry by the condenser because there was five degree water running through it. Anyway, the details are, are not important. Problem, the point is, at 10 kPa, we could not maintain the vapor pressure, and the plant couldn't transpire enough water into the atmosphere to sustain the vapor pressure, and therefore it wilted. Plants don't really care about a measly one bar. They sustain routinely 10 to 20 times, and in this part of the world, 30 or 40 times atmospheric pressure with a minus sign in front of it. So uh, minus, minus 10 or 15 bars uh, in, in, in hydrostatic pressures is a routine daily occurrence for a stress and recovery cycle of, of a north temperate species, God knows what it is in this part of the world. Uh, so that, that little bit of atmospheric pressure modification had no effect on the plant. It was responding to how much water was not in the air, the vapor pressure deficit. And that was exceeding the demand that the plant could respond to, and so it wilted. And as soon as you restored that condition, it came back to life. So I, I don't use this as a demonstration of our inability to manage the atmosphere. By the way, we can do it routinely now, we've fixed all that, and we can routinely grow plants at 10 kilopascals as long as there's enough oxygen. Uh, but I use this as a demonstration to my NASA engineer colleagues who are very skeptical about the contributions plant biology might make, and I say, here's your food production system, your oxygen generator, your CO2 scrubber, and your fresh water recycler. It broke fixed itself and uh, you know hold up any of your moving parts technology to compete with that and that usually quietens them briefly.